this is a briefing about Trident Juncture 2015. We thought it's a good opportunity to start early to brief you on uh, an important exercise uh, that will take place this autumn. In fact, it will be NATO's biggest uh, exercise in over a decade. And we have two senior uh, military officials to provide more details and to answer any questions. Uh, and they are happy to uh, go into detail on the name, the scenario, the locations, the participations, and the reach of the exercise. So uh, we have uh, with us today Lieutenant General Phil Jones, who's the Chief of Staff of Supreme Allied Command Transformation, uh, which is, of course, the NATO command organizing this exercise. Um, and he's come all the way from Norfolk, Virginia, in the US. Uh, General Hans Lothar Domröse, commander of Joint Force, Com uh, Joint Force Command Brunson, uh, who will be the commanding officer for Trident Juncture, and he's come all the way from the Netherlands. Uh, but before I, uh, I give the two gentlemen the floor, let me just give you uh, some of the basics. Uh, Trident Juncture 15 will take place in October and November. Uh, mainly in Spain, uh, Italy, and Portugal. It's one of a series of long-planned exercises to ensure that NATO allies are ready to deal with any emerging crisis from any direction and that they are able to work effectively with partners in tackling uh, any crisis. Of course, this exercise um, takes on additional significance because of the changed security environment that we find ourselves in, uh, the rising challenges from both uh, the South and the East, uh, to which NATO is adapting and continues to adapt. Overall, we expect over 36,000 troops from 30 nations to take part. Uh, that includes NATO allies, as well as seven partner nations. And those partner nations are Australia, Austria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Finland, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Sweden and Ukraine. The exercise will also demonstrate NATO's ability to work with international organizations to deal with a crisis, uh, which is what we call the comprehensive approach. Uh, and we have confirmed participation from the European Union, the African Union and international humanitarian organizations. Uh, I said at the start that it's the biggest, the most ambitious um, exercise uh, that uh, uh, NATO has undertaken since uh, over a decade. In fact, before you ask, let me tell you uh, that the previous uh, biggest exercise took place in 2002, uh, and that was uh, uh, the exercise preparing um, the NATO response force. Uh, it uh, was exercise Strong Resolve, which took place in Norway and Poland with over 40,000 troops from, at that time, 15 allies and 12 partner nations. Finally, as all NATO exercises, Trident Juncture 15 has been planned in an open, transparent, predictable way. You will have seen it on our website for some time. Uh, it was announced uh, over a year ago by the Secretary General. Uh, and, of course, international observers from all OSCE countries and several non-OSE countries will be invited. You, uh, journalists, uh, of course, are also invited as to uh, all NATO exercises, and that's why we're holding this briefing. Um, my colleagues, after the briefing, will be happy to give you more details should you need them now, and of course, to register an interest in taking part in the media days. Uh, one last important point, if you want to tweet about this briefing or indeed about the exercise, the hashtag is hashtag TJ15, rather predictable, uh, and of course, hashtag NATO. With this, let me pass the floor first to Lieutenant General Phil Jones. Well, no, thanks very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here on behalf of my boss, the Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation. Um, General Palomares himself would dearly like to have been here himself and send his apologies. Um, the Allied Command for Transformation is one of NATO's two military strategic headquarters, and we, as you just heard, we are the only NATO headquarters based in North America. Our role in NATO is to lead the continual transformation of NATO's forces from far distant concepts right way through to the reality of readiness, capacity, and military effectiveness. And a key role for us as a headquarters in this transformation continuum, if you like, is to shape and prepare our forces through ambitious, realistic training and exercises. 
And in that respect, we feel immense pride in this exercise, tried in Juncture 15, that marks for NATO a really important milestone in the transformation and adaptation of our alliance forces. It's been deliberately planned, as you've just heard, to be a keystone event for NATO as we shift our focus from over a decade of really high-intensity counterinsurgency to start to recalibrate our posture for the current security environment. The exercise is of strategic importance to NATO, and it's been one of our highest planning priorities for the past two years. And it's worth noting that the current scope and scale of this exercise has exceeded the original planning assumptions by some margin. And the energetic commitment of our nations to this exercise has been exciting to observe. From our perspective, it's a very clear demonstration of the solidarity of the Alliance and our collective determination to ensure the peace and security of the Euro-Atlantic region. And for Alliance military forces, it's also an affirmation of our cap cap capability and capacity to evolve rapidly and to respond to the changing environment that we find in the world around us. This exercise is a focal point for testing, validating, experimenting, developing, and training our joint forces at the scale, scope, and level of complexity that our current and future security challenges demand. In Trident Juncture 2015, we'll be using um, new and evolving concepts, advanced technology, uh, cutting edge military capabilities, and the world's most modern land, sea, and air forces in the most complex and realistic scenarios. As you've heard, 27 of the 28 nations will be providing military units and staff for the exercise together with units from seven partner nations. And we have soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines and civilians totaling now in excess of 36,000. Right at the center of this exercise, as you'll hear more from General Don Rose in a moment, we'll train and evaluate and certify our reformed and enhanced NATO response forces. So this exercise is set in a fictitious geographical region known as Sorotan. This is a scenario that's been developing over recent years as a highly realistic vehicle for training and developing NATO and partner forces in a wide range of complex crisis settings. It capitalizes, of course, on the lessons from the past 20 years of NATO-led operations, including, of course, the Afghan campaign. But really importantly, it's a modern vehicle in which to reflect the highly complex security challenges of today and to allow us to experiment for the future. This fictitious but realistic setting sees a crisis unfold beyond NATO's borders in a fictional country which is victim of internal tensions, natural hazards, and a neighbor's aggression. This out-of-area setting, in NATO terms, has been designed to allow enough scope, depth, and flexibility to really challenge our forces in the pursuit of an ambitious strategic and operational civilian and military campaign. Events within the exercise um, will range from the effects of subversion and terrorism to grand military maneuver on a large scale from the conditions of chemical warfare to the battlegrounds of cyber and information, from the intricacies of tribal rivalries to the challenges of unpredictable and autocratic political leaders. The integration of non-NATO forces into Trident Juncture 15 provided by partner nations is of huge mutual benefit. Many of our partners have vast experience and considerable expertise, and our cooperative approach to shared security is being further developed in this exercise. The participation of a wide range of international organizations and NGOs and agencies has become standard in NATO's training and exercising philosophy. The ability of, for us all to act together, to understand each other's perspectives, to communicate and interact is a key element of any crisis response. There's no such thing as a purely military solution. And the presence of non-NATO military observers is part of the, the Alliance's commitment to transparency and openness in every respect. And for the first time, we've also invited a large number of defense industries to take part in the exercise and to observe evolutions. With the aim of generating exchanges and to bring insights and perspectives to possible technological um, solutions for the future and to accelerate military innovation. Finally, before I hand over to General Don Rosa, let me just uh, offer a vote of thanks to the host nations, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. Those nations have gone to great lengths to accommodate the training requirements of the troop contributing nations and to adapt their exercise ranges and training facilities to host logistical support of the deployed elements. The bulk of the life training area will cover a huge part of the southwest of Europe, offering ample space to conduct safely the complex and demanding air, land, and maritime training events of such a large military force. This exercise, as you've heard, is open to the media, and we very much look forward to seeing you all at the many media events throughout the period. So the Allied Command for Transformation is the architect of NATO's collective training strategy 
is very proud to be part of this public launch, and I'll now hand over to General Dom Rosa, who is one of NATO's most experienced and most respected commanders, and is exactly the right leader for this exercise of strategic importance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Juana. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Juana, uh, for your kind words. And really, it's, uh, I welcome this opportunity to talk a little bit about Trident Juncture. And I'm honored and privileged that my headquarters has been selected uh, to conduct this exercise. So as, as was said already, I'm the officer conducting the exercise. So we have theories and we have reality, and I have to implement theories into reality. And that is the role and responsibility for an officer conducting the exercise. This exercise has more or less three purposes. First, I'm the designated NATO Response Force Commander for 16 next year. And as you would have expected, these forces coming from nations, as you heard, and part allies and partners have to be trained properly in order to be ready on the 1st of January. So it is timely a preparation phase. Secondly, we will have to implement the Wales Summit uh, uh, findings. And uh, let me recall that our heads of states and government decided to uh, form the NRF, the uh, Fire Brigade of NATO, more agile, bigger, uh, and, and more flexible. And we will do some test bedding functions in Spain, Italy, and Portugal. So this is the second part of the uh, uh, training uh, in the end. And thirdly, as was indicated already, we have to acknowledge that military is only one tool in the toolbox. There are always other actors, very important actors. So I'm extremely proud that we have so many IOs and NGOs participating in this exercise. And the difference between all the other exercises was that they are participating in the exercise from the very beginning. So they are part of the scripting. It is not wild ideas that we have. We take reality from their experience directly into that scenario. And that is the beauty of the comprehensive approach, if you will. And that is the beauty of working in a, in a group of agile and cohesive uh, uh, members of the alliance. And virtually, it is the whole world uh, participating uh, from partners and allies from all continents, as was mentioned before. So it will be a very ambitious exercise uh, Oana thought uh, it might be the biggest exercise, but what I'm focusing more is technique, tactics, and to improve uh, procedures and try to make the operational forces, that's what I'm talking about, more capable. So it is not the numbers, it is the quality that matters, I, I hope. So the VJTF is one of those elements of our uh, test bed, whereby we want to demonstrate uh, how quickly we can employ this uh, brigade size unit of 5,000, move from one edge to the other edge, obviously in, in, in the given area, and that is fantastic also. Uh, we do include, we invite, international observers, I should have said, and I, I'm really proud. There is no secret. We do this exercise. Uh, there is a secret what decisions I will take. But the rest is transparent. And my decisions during the exercise will be transparent once I have taken them. So Russia and all the others who are interested for following all the treatments will be invited. Uh, that is for sure. That is, uh, uh, if, if, if I may, it's a great honor, and, and you can trust us. So in the end, we have invested significantly in, into the scenario, in planning and conducting series of, of uh, similar exercises to lead up to Trident Juncture 15 in order to improve our skills and capabilities. And uh, you have heard the Connected Forces initiatives. It's not so easy that uh, so many nations or forces from so many nations work together. So obviously, we, you all have a smartphone. We have a smartphone also, what we call it CIS, so it is uh, our communication system. And 
we, we can communicate each other and that is fine. So uh, we have to work together, learn each other uh, uh, better to understand and in the end I have to report to our Supreme Allied Commander the NRF, the Fire Brigade for NATO, stands ready, is prepared, is exercised and usable for 16. So it's a great honor, but it is also stress. The IOs and NGOs, let me stress the importance of EU as we sit here almost in the EU uh, parliament. The EU has everything, almost everything that is required these days if you want to calm down a crisis situation. They have experts, they have lawyers, and I was told the EU is rich, they even have money. But NATO has this unique capability of bringing uh, 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 military power uh, uh, to the added value. So military and the non-military actors working together, trying to win the peace. And let me repeat this. I am always aiming at winning peace. To fight the battle, trust me, we can do this. 24-7, almost everyone. But to win the peace, is key and we want to demonstrate how we can stabilize in a given scenario a situation and how we can help the poor people in order to have a better life tomorrow. And that is what I would call winning peace and this is only possible and we know it by heart, uh, it's only possible with international organizations and big organizations like the Red Cross, hum humanitarian assistance and the EU as a, a, a real power broker. So we are delighted uh, to put these forces together. In the end, the intended outcome will be, yes, when you come and visit us, you hopefully will see NATO is capable, NATO is agile, and NATO is prepared for any challenge uh, and we are ready to go if required and politically mandated. Thank you very much indeed.